So let's get excited with the accounting treatment. The first thing we want to look at is what is the recognition criteria for property plants and equipment? Two things generally. Number one, it is probable that a future economic benefits associated with the item will flow to the entity. Definitely. And then number two, the cost of the item can be measured reliably. That is the idea about the recognition criteria of property plants and equipment or assets in general. However, it is important we understand this that when it comes to subsequent costs, all subsequent costs incurred will be just added to the current amount of the asset. What does that mean? It means that let's say if we go back to this example, let's say in 2024 year ended. So remember 2024 will start from 1st November 2023. So imagine the entity did some improvement in the assets that they bought. We will just add it to it. Okay, we will just add any capital expenditure in terms of improvements that the entity did, not repairs. Repairs are written off in the PL. But if it is an overhaul of the asset or a capital expenditure that we incur, that increases the efficiency of the asset or the economic useful life of the asset or the value of the asset, then that cost cannot be written off in the PL account. Instead, it must be added to the current amount of the asset. So whatever cost we incur, as a capital expenditure to improve the asset would just be added to the current amount so that we get a restated balance on which we would start to calculate depreciation for the year ended 2024. That is what we mean by treatment of subsequent expenditures. But how do we measure assets initially? Because I mentioned that a moment ago. How do we measure assets initially? So what is the initial cost of the asset or what should be included in the initial cost of the asset very simple as per the standard the initial cost of the asset shall include the purchases price if we bought it less trade discount or any rebates we got plus directly attributable cost incurred in bringing the asset to its present use and initial estimate of the unavoidable cost of dismantling and removing the item and restoring the site on which it is located. What does that mean? It means that the initial cost of the asset will be the purchases cost, how much we paid for it. But that purchases cost will be less any trade discounts that we got. Remember, there are two types of discounts, trade discount and cash discount. Trade discount is a discount we receive because we bought something specific or we bought something of a high value or we bought something in a large quantity. We get a trade discount. Then other cost incurred in bringing the asset to its present use. Like if it is from outside, maybe import duty that we pay. Delivery cost that we pay. Maybe we engage a professional when we're buying that asset. So that professional fee will be included in the initial cost of the asset. Hey, probably we borrowed money to manufacture the asset or to purchase the asset. So the borrowing cost will have to also be included in the initial cost. This is where IAS 23 comes to town. And we're going to be talking about that later on. Or sometimes we are going to be dealing with what you see here, the dismantling cost. And that is the issue in relation to IAS 37. We will talk about that also pretty later in our discussion. Then if it requires installation, installation cost would have to also be included in the initial cost. Then the issue in relation to pre-production testing cost would have to also be included in the initial cost of the asset. And there are a couple of other issues, but that is what we mean by determination of the initial measurement of the asset or the initial cost of the asset. Then after the initial measurement, there has to be subsequent measurement. And the standard permits a choice of measurement models subsequent to the initial recognition. And that is two things. Either the entity can choose the cost model or the revaluation model. It is the entity's choice to decide which option they must go for, the cost model or the revaluation model. But let's share some lights a little on these 
two. Now, the choice of which method to use depends on a number of factors. Number one, if the fair value of the assets can reliably be measured, then the entity will use the revaluation model. Number two, if the asset is of a specialized nature and will require significant modification before a third party can use it, then the entity will use the cost model. So that is what you need to understand when it comes to which method will be appropriate for the entity. But under the cost model, the asset is carried at its historical cost, less any accumulated depreciation or impairment loss. What it means then is that in the revaluation model, we do the flip side. Here, the asset is carried at a fair value or revalued amount, less any accumulated depreciation or impairment loss. But let me tell you this. Although the standard permits these two, it is also required that assets should not be carried above their recoverable amount and at least once a year the entity is required to revalue its assets so majority of the assets of the entity unless otherwise the assets are of a specialized nature and will require significant modification before they can be used by a third party the entity is going to be carrying them at the revaluation model because on subsequent measurements the assets will be revalued and that is what leads us to a bigger picture here how we deal with revaluation of assets and i want you to pay attention carefully here because it's a very simple principle we're going to explain it then we take a simple illustration so you see exactly what is going on so when an asset is valued two things can happen either there will be an upward revaluation or a downward revaluation when there is an upward revaluation, it means that the revalued amount or maybe the, fair the revalued amount is greater than the current value of the asset. An upward revaluation always results into what we call a revaluation surplus or a revaluation gain. A downward revaluation, on the other hand, is when the revalued amount is less than the current value, meaning the asset is being carried at an amount greater than the revalued amount or greater than the fair value of the asset. When this happens, it creates a revaluation loss. It's a revaluation loss. So that is the distinction between upward revaluation and a downward revaluation. But how do we account for it? When an asset is revalued and it is an upward revaluation, before we determine whether it should be taken to the PL or the other comprehensive income we have to ask ourselves a question and the question is has the asset previously suffered a downward revaluation in other words the asset that has now been revalued upward has it previously suffered a loss two answers can come up no it hasn't suffered any loss previously in that case, then we recognize the increase, which is a revaluation surplus, in the other comprehensive income and revaluation reserve on the face of the statement of financial position. It means that per general entry principle, the revaluation surplus will be added to property, plant, and equipment. So we debit property, plant, and equipment, and then credit other comprehensive income as well as revaluation reserves on the face of the statement of financial position but the second scenario yes yes means that right this asset that has an upper revaluation previously has suffered a loss if the asset has suffered a loss previously we recognize the increase in the profit or loss up to the value of the downward valuation then any excess is taken to revaluation surplus and in the oci so if previously the asset has suffered a downward revaluation then you don't take the revaluation surplus to oci like we have stated here so you're going to debit property plant and equipment anyways but first you have to credit the profit or loss up to the amount that the asset had suffered previously in the downward revaluation then if it happens that the surplus is more than the previous year's downward revaluation the balancing figure is taken to revaluation reserve or revaluation 
reserve on the face of the statement of financial position as well as oci now note that there is a deferred tax implication of this we'll look at it later on so there is a deferred tax implication of upward revaluation that we need to deal with and even downward revaluation we need to deal with it later on then on the right side downward revaluation so if we revalue the assets and it has a downward revaluation meaning that the revalued amount is less than the carrying amount meaning the asset is being carried at an amount higher than its fair value then its treatment will depend on the answer we have to this particular question what does that mean has the asset previously had an upward revaluation stay with me carefully no it hadn't had an upward revaluation in the previous period if that is the case, then that revaluation loss is definitely taken to the PL account. No P on that. You're going to debit profit or loss and then credit property, plant, and equipment because the asset hadn't previously revalued upward. But if the asset had previously been valued upward and now it is having a downward revaluation, then it means that asset had some revaluation reserve. So we recognize the decrease against the revaluation surplus up to the value of the upward revaluation any excess is recognized directly in the pnl account what does that mean it means that if there is a downward revaluation however the asset had previously been valued upward that means there is a revaluation surplus available so general entry will be will debit the revaluation reserve will credit ppe because the asset had to be written down in value then if it happens that the reval downward revaluation which is the revaluation loss is greater than the amount remaining in respect of this asset in the revaluation reserve then the balancing figure is going to be debited into the profit or loss so it means that in the treatment of assets revalued you don't just get up and say oh because it's a loss let's take it to pnl because it's a gain let's go to oci no you have to ask yourself is there is this asset or has this asset been revalued previously and if it was what was the result the outcome of that previous revaluation has to be reversed with the subsequent revaluation that we just had that is what we must understand when it comes to assets being revalued so that is the idea about the basic principles that you need to understand generally when it comes to dealing with IAS 16 at its core now one thing you need to understand is this that once an asset had been revalued the depreciation from that e time must then be calculated on the revalued amount and usually where the, there is an upper revaluation it means more depreciation will be charged than expected because of this the entity may elect to compensate shareholders for the excess depreciation which reduced profit because you know dividend is paid from profit so when you have an upward revaluation and you are charging depreciation on the revalued amount it means the depreciation charge for the year is going to be higher than it should have been when that happens it means there will be less dividend available to shareholders so sometimes the entity may elect please note this is optional so in the question if the question is quiet don't do it if the question is specific, follow the directive of the question. So how does the entity compensate? The entity does the compensation by transferring part of the revaluation surplus in respect of the excess depreciation to the retained earnings. So how does that work? Two options. The transfer can be the revaluation surplus or the revaluation gain divided by the remaining economic use for life okay divided by the remaining economic use for life x over 12 x over 12 because of the fact that the year is less than or the period for the revaluation is less than 12 months then once we do that the journal entry is going to be pretty simple we would debit revaluation reserves remember you credited it when there was the gain so now you debit it to remove that transfer then you go and credit retain earnings so that shareholders will get back 
the original profit exclusive of the effect of the excess depreciation as a result of the upward revaluation. So that is what you need to understand when it comes to dealing with revaluation of assets, especially when there is upward revaluation, then that transfer will be done. If there is a downward revaluation, that one shareholders are not going to uh, be compensated for that or <laughs> get anything for it. But if there's an upward revaluation, that is where we have to compensate them. And like I said, it depends on the context of the question. And that is what you need to understand when we talk about IAS 16 in its raw or basic form. In the next video, we are going to be taking an illustrative question to see how some of these principles actually apply and how we can do the various treatments. I'll see you in the next video.